Welcome to Driving Company Growth Through Creating a Cultural Ownership, sponsored by Morgan Stanley at Work. Here's our host, Vice President of Head of Industry Engagement and Learning at Morgan Stanley at Work, Rodney Bolden. Welcome, and thank you for joining. I'm Rodney Bolden, Vice President and Head of Industry Engagement and Learning here at Morgan Stanley at Work, a suite of financial services and resources offered by Morgan Stanley to help employers and employees manage their financial well-being and make informed decisions about their financial future. Today we'll be talking with three experts about how embracing a culture of ownership can help your business succeed today and into the future. We hope this to be an engaging conversation. Feel free to submit audience questions by using the Q&A widget below. You can also find additional resources here on the event site on insider.com. And feel free to join the conversation on social using the hashtag Morgan Stanley at Work. We are also curious to know what you enjoyed most about today's event. So please take our survey, which you can do so by clicking on the link at the bottom of the page. And now I'd like our panelists to introduce themselves and share a little bit about their background. Sean, let's start with you. Thanks, Rodney. My name is Sean Murphy, and I'm the Chief Client Officer for Morgan Stanley at Work, a Global Equity Solutions. Um, I've been at Morgan Stanley for about 20 years and working primarily with private companies over the last almost decade. And I'm excited to be here today. Excellent. Laura, can you introduce yourself and share a little bit about your background? Thank you, Rodney. Um, hi, my name is Laura St. Charles. I'm a senior paralegal and for corporate and equity administration here at Acorns. I've been here for about two years, but I have about 20 years of experience as a paralegal, and I'm really excited to be here today to share my experience with you all. And last but certainly not least, Terry. Hi, I'm Terry McFadden with Norwest Venture Partners. We are a venture and growth equity investment firm, and I've been with the firm for a little over 14 years now, working with all of our startups across their talent and their compensation planning. Uh, I did establish the talent function here again a little over 14 years ago, and I've been working with startups for longer than I want to admit, uh, but I am uh, happy to be joining all of you today in this conversation. Excellent. Thanks, Sean, Laura, and Terry for joining me for today's discussion. Let's get started with our first segment. Equity compensation can drive employee motivation. Now, for this first segment, I want to begin by asking you, Terry, how can companies create a compelling employee equity experience that supports a culture of ownership and helps them to attract and retain talent? Yeah, I think for us, particularly given that we work with early stage venture backed portfolio companies, the biggest value that employees get is in the initial grant that they receive. And it's really important for portfolio companies to foster a culture that values that initial grant and really messages to employees the value of that initial grant. The new hire is the new hire grant is where employees will get the bulk of their wealth creation, so to speak. Um, and so I think that ties into messaging, communication, education of all of your employees. And again, fostering and creating a, a culture that really values that. I agree. I think um, for new um, for new hire employees, really understanding sort of what the vesting period is, um, what's you know helping them understand what strike price means, um, how that how that grows over time. So hopefully the strike prices go up and they have a lower strike price and can re realize the benefit of that. Um, I think that's something that at the beginning of any employee's tenure at the company, you really want to help educate them on. Right. I mean, ed education is huge. I agree with both Terry and Laura. Not, not everyone knows the ins and outs. And indeed, people will need guidance in order to be able to fully understand the value of their shares. And so there's a recent research article that came out from the Journal of Law, Economics, and Organization, published by Oxford. And it examined the employee's financial literacy, especially in regard to uh, equity compensation. And the findings suggest that employees are willing to forego cash compensation in exchange for equity, but only have a small fraction of these employees actually have the financial knowledge to make those informed decisions. 
regarding equity. And so in, in this survey, which surveyed about 3,000 American employees, which had at least a college level STEM education, when asked if they would prefer stock options with lower or higher exercise price, only 36% answered the questions correctly. And just 28% of these correctly answered a question that was uh, the relative risk levels of restricted stock versus stock options. And then when they were asked if it was more advantageous to receive an equity grant from a startup that was, had raised more or less venture capital funds when um, both startups have similar valuations and cash reserves, only less than 20% answered that correctly. So now that we, you know, we're really finding a tie to the Morgan Stanley Liquidity Trends Annual Report, which also uh, concluded that 73% of companies state that equity is seen as more valuable, right, to prospective talent and to their employees. And not only upon that initial grant that Terry mentioned, which is so critically important, but also regularly thereafter. And so to ensure that these employees actually understand the value of the equity that you're giving them and make these appropriate financial decisions based upon their personal circumstances, we have to continue to not only educate at that initial time, but then you know regularly thereafter. I mean, I'm having a conversation right now where I'm trying to do further education for our employees here. Um, and it's because when they come in, you know, we, we tell them about it, we try to educate them, but yeah, to help them understand on an ongoing basis, you know, uh, where's the 409A valuation? What does that mean for them? You know, um, one of the questions we always get is what's the difference between an RSU and, you know, the ISO, you know, and really kind of helping them under differentiate between those two and what that means for them um, in both the short and the long term. Yeah, I was just going to weigh in as well. One of the things that we, um, we've we done with our portfolio companies and highly recommend is manager training as well, because you get a lot of new managers, first-time managers, who also don't understand. And so when their employees come to them, they need to be in a position to be able to answer the questions correctly and fully. Uh, and so that is part of what we uh, encourage all of our portfolio companies to do from the early stages. Yeah, at least if they can answer the question, be able to guide the employee to where they can get the answers that they need. For sure. And I think you brought up another interesting point, which is we have some, most of our early stage portfolio companies work with stock options, right? So you mentioned ISOs, but some of our later stage portfolio companies have transitioned to RSUs. And again, understanding the difference between the two and the impact to the employees and how to message that appropriately what are the benefits of again moving from a stock option to an RSU to some of the portfolio or to some of the the employees that are receiving them? And what we see our companies doing is is assuming that employees understand those intricacies, and they instead when they identify the need for education, they're just focusing on the basics, like an equity 101 type of training. Like what does this mean? What does that mean? Um, which is then empowering to the individual when they're looking to make decisions. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think a lot of assumptions are made about what people do or do not know. And I think starting from kind of the equity 101, where you go to the most basic level is really helpful. And then building on that for employees, you know, where you start talking about other um, issues for them, um, other financial tools that are available to them that they can access. Laura, how do you identify, because you talk about assumptions that are being made as to knowledge and what are the knowledge gaps? How do you identify that? What are the knowledge gaps there? Well, for, for one, I, I get asked questions and I sort of take note of like, what are the questions that I'm hearing most often from people? Um, but honestly, I just, I, I impress upon HR to have people come talk to me or to reach out directly to ShareWorks, our provider. Um, and, but I, do the equity 101 for employees and I encourage that that everybody attend and then from there you know have them reach out to us and help them with their any other questions they have that sort of but start from that base um, I think assuming that people understand what an option is and how it works um, isn't always isn't always accurate you know, um, and so and so you, you want to give them the opportunity to engage at the basic level and then we can build on from there. Yeah, that's understandable. And it leads me into segment number two, which is what to account for when expanding globally. And 
you know, when looking at that, cultural norms, rules, regulations are different across the globe. So Laura, I want to continue with you for a moment. What are some of the nuances companies should be aware of when looking to provide a holistic equity participant experience to international employees? I think, first of all, you, you really need to engage um, in-country um, resources, tax, um, also people who understand the laws and regulations that rule equity plans in those countries. Um, you know, we recently expanded Acorns into uh, the UK. We acquired a UK company and have set up a seesaw plan. And so we had to have conversations about what exactly that means, um, what that, what those equity grants look like, what are the terms that you can you can apply to those grants in that country, um, and then educating employees in that country because. It's not as common, I'm, I'm coming to find, it is not as common there to give out equity grants in the UK as it is here in the US. And so there's definitely a need to have an equity 101 conversation with the employees there. Um, and so those are, the, those are the things that, that's the most basic level that we're at. I would also imagine that here in the US, most workplace financial benefits are considered individual benefits for the employee. However, I've heard overseas benefits like equity compensation and, and others are really considered more of a family type of benefit. So what steps can you take, and, and uh, Sean or Terry, feel free to join in with this, what steps can you take to make sure that the family is aware since it's considered a family benefit in addition to just benefited, benefiting the employee. Well, I can jump in there if you want, uh, Terry. But from, from my perspective, what we see across our client base is that while it's um, more heavily weighted in, in maybe Europe, it, it is something that is a concern or an area of focus uh, across the globe with when you're looking at wealth, when you're looking at income, when you're looking at investments, you need to be planning for the family unit and whatever that family unit may look like. It could be aging parents, it could be children, it could be siblings, uh, it could be dogs, right? And so you really need to be taking into account the entire person's world while you're looking to educate them and also determine what the right compensation strategies are. So we take an approach where we make sure that we provide education for the employees as well as their families. And so there may be events or the, even these equity one, one trainings that we keep referring to, but more complicated ones as well around taxation, compliance, like what do you need to be thinking about? We bring in and we encourage participants and employees to bring in their family members to also get educated so that we're providing a much more holistic experience for them to be making decisions as a collective unit, which a family indeed is. And I think this also ties into the education piece of it, which is, you know, a couple of things have happened over the last few decades, one of which is startups are taking longer to exit. So you're holding on to this equity for a longer and longer period of time. And if you have decisions to be made around planning for college tuition and things like that, what is the liquidity potential for you and the timing for that for your holdings, right? Uh, not to mention tax consequences. Again, in some of these international locations, there might be heavier tax burden or tax consequences to receiving the equity than we get in the United States around stock options. Um, and also depending on how RSUs are structured, again, and as vesting happens with RSUs, you have tax obligations on those vested RSUs, which is why a lot of our startup companies are putting double triggers tied to an actual exit event so that they don't have to start paying taxes on a not yet liquid stock. So these are all the things to think about, and I think to Sean's point, both in the US and globally, but we know that some of our portfolio companies have decided with locations outside of the United States to not give additional equity in the form of retention programs, which I know we're talking about later, but there's decisions. It's not all one size fits all for every single geography. Um, you have to do what's best for the employees and again, be in a position to really communicate the benefits and why you're making those decisions.
Um, I was just going to add, you know, I think what we're saying really is that in order to be able to provide equity and solutions as you grow globally, you really need to be making sure that you're managing your data, whatever solution you're putting in place is scalable. So, you know, handling your shareholders and employee population within one country is hard enough. But most clients, as you begin to operate globally, it becomes even more complicated. So where you have critical mass in certain countries and offer broad-based equity programs, um, then you may have the um, willingness or resources to be able to invest in making sure that you're doing it the right way. But there's other situations where you have one or two people outside of your headquarter location. And then it becomes even having one or two people triggers this whole spider web of compliance requirements, including regulatory findings, tax implications. And those have to be understood not just at that corporate level, but at the employee level too, right? And so part of the exercise that you need to go through uh, and we see our clients go through is let's identify our current and historical footprint geogra geographically, but then also make sure that we're planning for what our potential locations will be in the future. And then engaging with those subject matter experts on both securities law um, around offering stock and the tax and compliance requirements of each location and making sure that whatever equity platform you use will have a global compliance service and the ability to set up this automation based upon local tax rules. Otherwise, you're setting yourself up for considerable risk over time. And then it's also important that you have a corporate tax advisor. Um, what we've also advised, you know, when we're looking at mobility is it's, again, not just the individual or the corporate tax advisor. It's making sure that your individuals are um, introduced or have the resources to speak to a tax advisor locally in that geography if they've moved to understand what implications any of their individual decisions can also be on their personal tax situation. And so it's far more cost effective to set up those compliant policies and practices much earlier on than to deal with the audits and penalties that you may have later as, as you identify them because they weren't set up properly. Makes sense. And Laura, I know you <clears throat> wanted to add something as well. Um, just a couple of points. Um, one is I think that understanding your option pool, your, your option grants at the very beginning when you're setting up your plan is really important. Um, you you yeah. want to understand um, <clears throat> who, who, who your employees are, where they're located, what are the tax implications for the company as well as the employee with these grants. Um, if you hope to expand internationally, you need to put together a network of advisors that will help you do that in a way that best serves the company, but also the employees to help educate them about what are the tax implications for them in their particular areas? If they're moving from one, you know, one country to another, what does that mean for them? Um, and kind of going back to the whole family and, and how this affects the family, this is why I really encourage people that our option holders, our employees, to read their option agreement and to read the plan and understand, you know, what happens to their options. Um, if they were to become disabled or if they died, you know, make sure they're having that conversation with their family so they know what they need to do in order to secure that option. Um, and if they, you know, want to move it into a trust, is that something that they can do? Um, you know, and so those are the sorts of things that I would hope, I encourage people to read the plan, read their option agreement, and then come back, ask questions. Um, and if we can't answer it, help them find somebody who can answer their questions for them. I think all of these things tie into one broader uh, issue or even, I think, wave, if you will, within the startup world, which is pay transparency. And so all of this requires a lot of transparent communication with your employees. So holding it close to the vest is not the way to go in this environment, especially if you do in fact want to create a culture of ownership among all of your employees. I think having really open, transparent communication around the value of the options is really important. Terry, I wanna pick up on something you said earlier. You used the word retention. And I've heard the term retention equity. Can you help me to understand what is retention equity? Yeah, 
it, historically, a lot of people have termed retention equity refresh equity. And we really don't like that term because there's a connotation of it just happening automatically every year, which is really, I think, uh, an expectation set in large public companies where they do have refreshed options every year uh, or RSUs, refreshed RSUs every year. In the startup world, it's different. Uh, and I like to use the, the pie analogy. And uh, I know that we're sharing this chart, which shows that basically over time, the pieces of the pie between investors and employees and founders really changes. And I would say 30 years ago, so a few decades ago, the pie used to be fairly even um, all the way from beginning until exit. But that was when exits were happening in four to five years. And now if you're a really successful startup, the exit horizon is 8, 10, 12 years in some cases, sometimes even longer. And what happens with that is a lot of startups need to raise more money, which means more investors come in and they take a bigger piece of the pie. And so what you'll find is that in our later stage portfolio companies, they hit about 20% employee ownership. And that piece of the pie doesn't change a whole lot in the later stages. What does change is you go from 200 employees to 500 plus employees, and that piece of the pie is now being taken up by more people. And while we still think that the most important piece for people in terms of wealth creation is that new hire grant, what is also important is they are fully vested in most cases after four years. Most portfolio companies, most startups, have a four-year vesting program. So at four years, they're fully vested in that new hire grant. And so to keep the top performers in our companies motivated with a forward vesting horizon, if you will, we like to give them what we call retention equity. So there's generally a time-based component to this. So a lot of our portfolio companies start looking at employees as eligible for retention equity when they hit about three years. So when they're 75% vested in that new hire grant, not everyone gets it. And this is the important part of the message. There is also a performance component to it. And we look at it a little bit like a bonus, like a cash bonus, right? So this is the group that's eligible for it. And then on top of that, you put performance. And so again, in the early days, it might only be a handful of employees that are eligible, you know, your first eight engineers that were hired in the beginning. And it's possible all eight of those engineers are top performers and you're going to give them retention equity. But as a company scales, and again, now all of a sudden you have 300 employees and you have 50 or 60 that are not now eligible, retention equity programs, if you don't have that performance component and you don't scale back all of the people that are getting it. So again, in later stages, I would say maybe 20 to 30% of those eligible actually receive the retention equity. If instead it's a peanut butter approach, everybody gets it, it becomes very expensive to the option pool, which means dilution because you have to add more equity to your option pool, which means you have to add more equity, I won't get into the mechanics, but you have to more, add more equity overall in order to be able to add more equity to the, uh, the, the employee option pool in order to fund these programs. And that becomes highly dilutive for everyone. That also can become problematic because you need to have new hire grants, you need to have promotion grants, right? So this pie is feeding your new hires still, it's feeding your promotion grants, and it's, re it's feeding this retention equity program. So what we really encourage our portfolio companies when they first put these programs in place is to message that there is two components to retention equity, time-based and performance. Not everyone will get it. And going forward, you have that in place so that when the retention equity pr program rolls around when you're 300, 400 employees, people understand that it's not just a given. And then I will make one more point, let somebody else weigh in here. Uh, going back to retention equity is a nice to have, it's a bonus on top of your new hire grant. The wealth creation vehicle in startups is still that new hire grant. And it's where you really want people to focus. 
because they continue to create value in that new hire grant over time. So you're given the, the new hire grant maybe in the early days when the, uh, again, the strike price and the preferred are about the same, maybe it's about a dollar a share. Now you fast forward eight, 10 years, and it could be worth $10, it could be worth $15, it could be worth $20, right? But the retention equity grant that you got two years ago was at a much higher strike price most of the time. We'll get to that as well. But usually, right, as a company, yeah, fingers crossed, as a company grows, the strike price increases, which means you have to pay more to get that equity. So the upside potential is just not as great. So there are a lot of things to think about when doing a retention equity program. And again, planning and budgeting for the long haul really is what you need to do with these retention equity programs. And now I'll open it up yeah. to others. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's important to um, think about that at the beginning of the company's life, um, how how you want to proceed, um, because it is dilutive you know, to keep handing out options. And um, I think retention grants are a great way to motivate you know top top performers. And so it isn't just a matter of how long you've been here, you get a retention grant. But there's also, as you said there's an element of your performance that goes into the decision. Um, and so it's, it's another carrot for employees, um, to hopefully to make them want to do their best work for the company. We found it to be pretty noisy in um, 2021, specifically when retention was an issue and we had employees looking to leave and go to another startup. And so, CEOs, heads of HR were coming to us and saying, what can we do? Can we maybe start giving retention equity to employees earlier so that, again, they have more forward vesting horizon? So we, we had some portfolio companies get fairly creative and start giving retention equity when employees were maybe only 50% vested instead of 75% vested. But then they would do a boxcar vesting where the vesting didn't begin until their new hire grant was fully vested. And so we had portfolio companies try to get creative around some of those things. What I will say now is the market has shifted. And we didn't talk about this earlier, but one of the tools that some of our portfolio companies are utilizing right now is repricing. So again, strike prices got quite high uh, over the last few years. And as markets came down, and overall some of our portfolio companies saw their 409A valuations come down 30 plus percent, that meant strike prices came down. And employees who received their equity in the last few years found their equity technically underwater, so at a strike price that was below what today's current 409A valuation was. So we've had a lot of portfolio companies go through repricings for those equity holders that had their shares issued more recently and were, again, technically underwater. And so again, looking at retention equity programs, the, the thinking around, let's give it to you early because the strike price will go up. That, that argument's not holding as much weight these days. So we're finding most of our portfolio companies defaulting to, again, I think a reasonably conservative plan, looking at eligible employees when they're 75% vested, and again, looking at the top performers. Yeah, I can speak directly to the repricing. Um, we did do a repricing for our employees because we brought on a number of people um, around the time that we were anticipating um, going public via SPAC. And so our 409A valuations climbed dramatically. And so the strike prices were quite high. And then um, unfortunately, when the SPAC was terminated, um, we did a 409A after that. And the understandably, the strike price had dropped considerably. And so there were a large number of employees, not a large number, but a fairly sizable portion of the employees who um, had strike prices that were above the curve 409A valuation. So we're underwater and, you know, um, weren't necessarily happy about that and expressed that. And so our um, executives decided to do a repricing and um, it went really well and it made our employees very happy, you know, to see that their options um, were now, you know, 
in the money and that um, they didn't feel like they had options that weren't worth anything or that wouldn't be in their mind worth anything for perhaps several years down the road. Um, so it's a great way of, for ret retention, also a great way for just employee morale, you know, making sure that, you know, they feel like the, the company cares about them and it cares about them, you know, being happy, being well compensated for the work that they're doing to build, to build the company up. Yeah, I mean, both of what Terry and Laura shared, sorry, both of what Terry and Laura um, shared at this point is really indicative of the need for you to set your equity strategy and then continue to review it, not only about the stage that your company is in, but also the stage that the market is in, and then reassessing it. So retention equity is a tool to use for high-performing individuals that have reached the tenure where they're about to be fully vested, but there's also a lot of other tools out there that can be used as well to kind of motivate and retain employees. One of the things themes that I'm hearing is that companies are staying private longer these days. And Sean, I believe Morgan Stanley at work has some research to support that as well. And so I want to ask you, what strategies can companies employ to help employees adjust to the liquidity event being further in the future? Well, you're right, Rodney. We launch a annual survey on liquidity trends every year. And what we found in the survey from last year was that over 37% of private company are staying private longer. And Terry mentioned before that it used to be around that three to four year mark. It's now eight to 12 years, which is significantly different. And that 93% of private companies reported that the possibility of having a company liquidity event is valuable to uh, prospective hires. So our clients are increasingly receiving questions about liquidity programs during the recruiting process, as well as in employee retention discussions. So they are feeling the pressure to convert paper wealth to investable wealth to allow these in their investors, but also their employees with an opportunity to either maybe diversify their portfolio, put a down payment on a house, or as mentioned before, even pay off a student loan. So we see companies addressing this demand and accounting for staying private longer in really three main ways. The first, which is the most common structure, is providing liquidity um, via a tender offer. So a tender offer, um, you issue a tender offer to create liquidity for employees, and then many of our clients create eligibility criteria, sometimes based on tenure, um, but other uh, dynamics as well, with really the objective of the tender offer, such as restricting eligibility to a certain subset of tenured employees. Uh, and we continuously see the number of liquidity events in the market for private companies increase year upon year. The second method is providing lending opportunities against their private shares so that they don't need to divest from them, but they can still create a path forward for what they want to do, either from a uh, reinvestment perspective and diversifying their wealth, or even, you know, as I said, putting a down payment on a house. But then the third way is a secondary transaction desk. So we've launched one within the last 12 to 18 months, and we're really, what we're able to do is to find buyers for people who are looking to exercise their private shares. Uh, it's a one-to-one -one trade. At the moment, what we're seeing out there in the market is that the bid and the ask is significantly different, right? The expectations on the seller um, is assuming this much higher valuation, and the buyers are coming in at probably a 30% discount to that. And so many companies haven't done this full reprice that we're discussing. And so the expectation of that seller is just very different of the buyer. And it's creating this disparity, which is not having as many transactions happening within the market um, between the real friction between the price point of supply and demand. So we do, we have seen that beginning to decrease that bid ask spread. And so I expect within the next sort of three to six months, we'll start seeing more secondary transactions happening. Um, but it's extremely important for what we're seeing across our employee base and client base is that you're providing some form of liquidity to your employees. It's interesting that it's a 30%. It's a 30% difference. I was wondering where it was right now. Yeah, we it was it was probably about 35% uh, six to 12 months ago, and I think it's nearing more to about a 25, 20% where we'll probably get to by the end of the year. Yeah, we, we did a, a secondary offer um, for our employees because of the SPAC not going through. And, you know, for those employees who've been here for a number of years and um, 
fully vested in an exercise or options and anticipation and being able to, to take advantage of us going public, we wanted to give them um, some liquidity since that was no longer on the table for them. Um, and that was another, you know, retention tool um, here in the company, um, recognizing that for some employees, that was what they'd been waiting for. You know, they really were excited about it and had been waiting for that opportunity and were disappointed and, and um, wanted to give them some liquidity, not as much as perhaps they would have had with the IPO, but something. Um, and uh, I think it was, I think the employees really appreciated it. I'm curious, do you, um, when you give your employees the opportunity to have liquidity, is it usually just a portion of their holdings that they can sell? And so you have them retain some of it? Yes, yeah, There's the, it's only a portion. Um, and they also have a certain um, tenure requirement here at the company. Um, in order to participate. Um, so it was our, you know, our, our employees who'd been here for a number of years who participated. Um, but yes, there was, there, there was only a portion. Um, they weren't able to liquidate all of their, their vested options um, in order to participate in, in the secondary. Um, yeah, that was something we thought about. Yeah, and that's what we've seen consistently across our client base as well, is that it's generally a portion with a tenure component to it. In the secondary market, are you seeing a lot of companies come forward who want to buy from option holders? Um, so the issuer sort of buyback is our most common transaction where they're looking to uh, engage with the employees. It's, it's less there are investors that are looking uh, to get into onto the cap table of our private companies. But over the last, I'd say, 18 to 24 months, it's been more issuer led transactions because of that separate, you know, the difference between you know, valuation and price. Another question I want to ask. When it comes to liquidity events, uh, secondaries, and availability of capital, what trends are you seeing in the market? And more importantly, how can companies stay ahead of these trends to position themselves for success? I'd like to hear from all of you, and I'll start with Sean. Sure. I mean, we're seeing several factors, right, influencing this drought of VC-backed IPOs. Some of the macroeconomic factors are inflation rates, right? we've seen rising interest rates, um, but there's also general uncertainty about the economic uh, stability and future, especially with some of the recent IPOs maybe not performing as well as expected or hoped for in the market. But there also continues to be, as we've referenced, this misalignment between valuation and pricing. So if we look in 2021, US VC-backed companies raised about 300 billion, which was near about 100% increase over 2020. But valuations have since reverted closer to historical averages, and companies are hesitant um, to list at these lower valuations. So as companies continue to remain private longer, equity and liquidity have increasingly become more important. But it's critical that private company leaders keep that in mind as they think through their equity plans and reconsider how to get their stakeholders access to this liquidity prior to an IPO. And we've executed over 100 private liquidity transactions with almost 20 billion in transaction volume. We've seen that participation rates across these events increase nearing up to 50% of eligible participants electing to be part of the transaction which was up from about 26% in 2021. So what that means is employees are aware that an IPO may not be in the short-term horizon for these companies, uh, so they're taking advantage of the liquidity events instead. We've also seen the number of oversubscribed liquidity events significantly increase. Uh, I think right now it's about 75% up from less than 20% in 2021, again, for the same reasons, right? The IPO not being on the short-term horizon. So employees continue to be eager for this liquidity and the continued downturn will shift into recovery at some point and companies need to be ready to react when it really does. So what we advise our clients to do in the meantime, while you know the um, IPO window is in essence you know, mostly closed, is to take this as an opportunity to really think about their current internal operations, right? We're all trying to do more with less and we're all trying to do that with staying true to our corporate values. And so we've been really focusing our, our uh, clients on this concept of transaction readiness. So how can you be ready for a transaction? Maybe it's a tender offer, but when it, you also have to be ready for an impending IPO. And so how do you do that to make sure that 
you know, you're surviving and, and eventually thriving in this market. And so it isn't something that companies um, should just consider in the face of an IPO. It's really kind of an operating ethos, especially if you leverage your equity programs and your business as a key motivator uh, and reward system for your employees. So it's really creating this like rigorous discipline and focus on data integrity. I already mentioned before some of the compliance components, but just data integrity overall. Looking at what are your systems, who are your vendors, what are your processes, making sure you're complying globally, and then what are you doing to engage with your shareholders um, and your employees? How are you educating them? How are you communicating to them what's happening? And making sure that you're continuing to go back to them about not just the current state of you know, the business growth, the strategy, but also their equity plan and what you're thinking in lines of that and making sure that that communication strategy is a core value that you continue to deliver to your employees. And this will really help you drive performance. Um, it'll make sure that you retain people because they feel part of the story, they don't feel excluded. You're providing that openness and transparency that our employee bases continue to, to ask for and making sure that you know when you're on this path to a large transaction, maybe an IPO, maybe not, but that you're, you know, you're regularly very early on and frequently thinking about how are you building this transaction readiness, because then it makes your team prepared for everything. Terry. Yeah, I think the truth is that the vast majority of startups don't go public, right? Most are actually acquired at some point, but you still have to have the same level of preparedness. And I think the financial upside can still be significant for all employees. And so it goes back to making sure that everybody has ownership and is bought into the strategy of the business and what that means and how that translates to the, their own personal wealth creation, right? So it's all tied together. And I think that goes back to, again, creating this sense of ownership. We're all in this together. And how do we create the most value in the equity for the company, which then again, creates value in my own personal holdings. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think, you know, helping people understand the vesting over time that, you know, they're continuing to become vested in their options over time um, and what that means for them and um, how that makes them, when they exercise their options, they become an owner in the company. They become somebody who, you know, is, is really has a stake in the company and in the, in the success of it. Right, and constantly reminding the employees of that connection. Right, that connection is the critical part. Yeah, you know your performance yeah. contributes to the stock price and the valuation, which contributes to your wealth. Right, and, and continuously reminding them of that story. Yeah, absolutely. Not surprisingly, during this great conversation, we've had a few audience questions come in, so let's try and answer a few. Uh, first one: What forms of communication have you found most helpful when educating your employee base on their equity plans? Um, Laura, would you like to start? Well, we schedule regular, I would say like quarterly, um, all hands meetings where we discuss this. We have some topic that discusses it. Um, and we set up one-on-ones for the new employees. Um, it's just so that we can talk about, we can educate the new employees on equity 101, but also having ongoing topics for our, our employees have been there for a while to help them understand all of the financial levers that um, are available to them. Um, and then having sort of what I would call office hours, you know, so letting them know that there are times when they can just, you know, reach out and speak to me um, about any of the equity questions that they have and either I can answer them or I can help them get connected to somebody who is able to answer that question for them. Oh, I like the group sessions and the one-on-ones. Those are nice. Yeah, I was going to say, there's just things people want to talk about that they're not comfortable talking about in a group setting. So I think having the office hours um, enables them to have those conversations. Um, and, and, you know, because you want them to come to you and um, help them um, find somebody who can help them if you can't do it yourself. And I think that three-pronged approach that you talk about, which is, again, you know, widespread communication, which comes from the CEO, the CFO, head of HR, right? And, and again, kiss, consistent, clear messaging, making sure that the managers maybe get that message ahead of time and are prepared to answer questions for their employees. 
And so from there, uh, most of our portfolio companies also send out an email, kind of a follow-up communication, frequently asked question um, guide, particularly around things like repricings, right? So if there's a, an, an education uh, event or moment, but as we've talked about, I think ongoing education also helps and communication helps. If you do that three-pronged approach where you have the company-wide communication followed up by an email with, again, any new changes to the business, to the stock option plan, to what have you, right? Uh, and then followed by the offer for these one-on-one -on -one office hours, whether that's with someone like Laura or your CFO or even your direct manager. Yeah, I mean, what we've seen over the last decades, right, many of us have experienced it, is that the way we communicate, the needs of communication, the modes of communication have evolved significantly. Right? So what we advise people, our, our companies to do is to say, you know, not to overcomplicate it, but create like a form of personas right, for the type of employees that you have. So maybe you have factory workers, maybe you don't. Not everyone is necessarily all within an office. Um, people are out in the field. They may not have access to the same level of Slack channels and technology that everybody does. And so, and certain generations are mobile and technology learning focused, right? And need to consume information in these like little bite-sized chunks, while other people prefer more contextual or contextual communication of learning um, and getting into the details in one sort of sitting. So what we suggest is you really need to tailor your approach in communicating um, based upon the culture of your uh, company, but then also the type of employees that you have and make sure that you understand that it's not a one size fits all approach, right? And no matter how much you do on broad based communication and then email confirmation, you're still going to end, end office hours, which are all things that are just like core that you have to do and you have to get done right. You're also going to have all these Slack channels that are gonna pop up that need to be monitored and answered and responded to so that you're making sure that people are getting the right information when they're asking the questions that they're asking. And so we want, we always encourage people to make sure that when you're discussing equity, that you always have a communication specialist at hand, right? Or at least someone within the team that's thinking about how do we communicate in the most effective manner to our employee base to ensure that the messages that they need to hear they're getting and the messages we need them to hear they're also getting. No, I agree. Yeah, because you also you also don't want any sort of rumor to get to get started in the Slack channels or anything, or bad information to just start spreading to the employee base. So you want to keep your eyes open and your ears open at all times. Absolutely, because employees do communicate with one another about benefits. Absolutely. Uh, let's go to the next question. What important factors have you seen play a role in an employee's decision to stay with a company? that is delaying going public. I'll throw that out, whoever wants to take it. Can I jump in just very quickly? Please. <laughs> uh, I, I think while compensation is important, right, and it's definitely a factor for employees, there are definitely other things to consider. Um, for a lot of our portfolio companies, it's about employee growth and the ability to, again, grow my career. Do I see long-term potential if you have created a great culture of ownership and people see the value in that new higher grants continuing to grow over time and their ability to impact that, right? Does the employee feel like they still have the ability to increase the value in that equity over the next two, three, four years to get them to that exit event? So it ties back to not just what is the company doing for me, but how can I personally impact that growth? And is there personal career growth for me? So I think in addition to all of this compensation focus, you also have to make sure you have good programs for employees to continue their own personal career growth inside of your company. hundred percent. I think, I think that's really important that if you want, if you want an employee to stay long-term, you want them to feel like they have opportunities to learn new skills, to promote within the company, to, to grow within their industry and their, their, their specialty. And I think um, Sean had made a good point, how it's all interconnected, right? So you can't do compensation in a vacuum. Uh, and so really, I think listening to your employees and finding out what's important to them. I think we have time for one more question from the audience. So let me see which one. 
Uh, here, what incentives do you find most effective to retain talent? Ooh, that's hard. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. Yeah. Well, we can we can we can take another <laughs> question. <laughs> Yeah, I think, Rodney, that relates a little bit to what we were answering before. So if we have the option to choose another one, maybe we do. Absolutely. Given the market conditions, when do you expect to see companies resume pursuing IPOs? <clears throat> that one's oh, even gosh. harder. Yeah. yeah. Like, do I have a crystal ball? Crystal ball. <laughs> okay. Final question. What advice would you give to a company that's planning to stay private longer and how can they best communicate those plans? Here's the key, communicate those plans to their employee base. The most impactful thing that was done following the termination of our SPAC was our CEO speaking directly to our employee base on a regular, um, on a regular cadence and trying to be as transparent as possible about what happened, you know, what our hopes were for the future um, and sort of giving employees, you know, a feel for what was going on. Um, you know, I, I think that was the thing that was most impactful for us. I think it's really important for portfolio companies too to message that what's going on in the macro environment, right, is somewhat separate from what's going on in the business. So if the business is still strong and performing well, and you still have plenty, in the case of our startups, plenty of cash in the bank to get through the next two years, right? I think that CEOs can communicate to employees the fact that you're in a really good spot, right? So we can continue to grow the business. We can continue to focus on expanding our product line or expanding into international or what, whatever the growth plans of the business are, Right. Even though macro conditions aren't allowing us to exit at this time, the growth of our business is still strong. And I think that is what's more motivating to employees. Not going public or the decision to stay private longer is not indicative of the business being in a bad state. It doesn't mean that the business isn't performing. Um, it's just not the right time, the right market, the right, to Terry's point, macroeconomic environment to look for a public listing. And being very open and transparent about why not now from a CEO perspective is vital. And then making sure that that same CEO provides the path forward about how we're going to continue to succeed as a private company and what that looks like at the corporate level and strategy, but then also what that looks like to the individual. This has been such a great discussion. I wish we had more time. Sean, Terry, Laura, thank you so much. But I want to ask each of you in 30 seconds or less, what is one key takeaway that you would like our audience to walk away with from today's discussion? Let's start with uh, you, Terry. Okay. Uh, I think I'll go back to communication and transparency with your employees, right? And that is probably, if you take nothing else away from this discussion, it's critical to creating this culture of ownership and to motivate employees. I think we didn't touch on this, but I'm going to throw it out there. Compensation is an emotional decision or emotional discussion, right? It, it really... I've seen it get quite emotional over the years. And so I think the more you can message and create that emotional tie-in to the business, the more successful you will be at retaining your employees. To follow on from that, what I would suggest to every company and, and the C-suite and beyond is in the decisions that you're making are the, what's right for the corporation and right for the business and the longevity of that business. And at the same time has impact to those individuals. And so in the, and when you're communicating those decisions, whether it's to stay private longer, whether it's to do retention equity or not, whether it's to do a tender offer or not, make sure that you're approaching your communication strategy using the lens of the employee and what they're feeling, experiencing and thinking during that time and try to get ahead of their potential you know, angst or questions or uncertainty about what those decisions do indeed mean. So it ties back to, and I, I'll say it again, even though Terry just did, it's openness, transparency in your communication approach. Excellent. Laura. And I agree with all that. And I would, I would say, you know, educating your employee base, they really only appreciate what they're getting if they truly understand what it is. 
um, and they are able to get their questions answered by the people at the company. So I would say educating your employees to really understand what their total compensation package is, that equity is a portion of it. Education, transparency, and communication. Thank you, Terry, Sean, and Laura, and a big thank you to our audience. I hope you were inspired by this conversation. And please remember to take our event survey. We'd love to hear from you. And don't forget to visit morganstanley.com at work for more information. I'm Rodney Bolden. Have a great day.